for everything from video games, comic books, films, and beyond. You're listening to the Geek Guy Podcast with your host, Albert Albanese, here on the Slam Sessions Podcast Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Geek Guy Podcast right here on the Slam Sessions Podcast Network. My name is Albert Albanese, and you can find everything podcast-related to the Slam Sessions, the Geek Guy Podcast, and beyond at the Slam Sessions on Twitter. Now, this is the inaugural episode of the Geek Guy Podcast, and what I want to do is kind of give you a little brief, bit of a brief synopsis about what this is. This is going to be a podcast can, pertaining to the world of geekdom, if you want to call it that. Uh, I'm going to talk about some video games, uh, a lot of stuff related to the comic book-related movies, and maybe some of the books themselves. Um, I'm thinking about, at a point, starting something that you know every week where I can maybe either review a comic or give you guys a suggestion. At the end of this podcast, I'm going to give you guys a, su- a suggestion of a comic to read. It may be something you guys have read already. Maybe it's something that was on your list that I think that you guys might want to actually read. And, of course... All things, you know, geek as you know, it pertains to the world out out there. I mean, uh, the thing we're going to really be going into today is Star Wars Rogue One, which is uh, I'm going to give you my review on that film. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so this is a huge deal. I've seen it twice, and I got to tell you guys, I absolutely love it. Um, but what we're going to do first is we're going to get into what you would go see in a movie, you know, in a movie theater. The trailers. We had a, a bunch of huge trailers that were. Uh, preceding Rogue One, and I'm going to give you some of my feedback on some of them. We're going to start off with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, Three huge Marvel movies coming out this year. We have Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, and Thor Ragnarok. Now, a lot of people uh, aren't talking a lot about Ragnarok because it's coming out in November. We haven't had a trailer release yet, but I got to tell you, I'm really excited about Ragnarok. From the stuff that I've heard, uh, the whole Ragnarok storyline, in, inside of that is going to be the Planet Hulk storyline, uh, Doctor Strange cameos, uh, cameos by uh, professional wrestlers. We got cameos in there from, or actually just, you know, we have the Grandmaster in there. Uh, we have... Uh, a whole host of other characters like Loki and Odin. This is really shaping up to be a really cool film. What looks to be the best standalone Thor film of the anthology, and that's exciting to see. Now, as far as the trailers go, man, Guardians of the Galaxy, how amazing does that film look? We have Star-Lord in there, you know, making his normal Star-Lord jokes and stuff like that, but, I mean, Drax the Destroyer, for me, stole that trailer. The scene where they're sitting there and they're talking about uh, the feelings that Peter Quill has for Gamora, and he's a little embarrassed, and Drax makes fun of him, and he's like, do me next, do me next. I mean, how hysterical is that? Dave Bautista is doing an excellent job as Drax. I think he's going to steal this film. But, I mean, it may be hard to steal a film when you have Baby Groot as a character in one of your movies. Um Baby Groot is absolutely the greatest marketing ploy in the history of uh, Marvel films. I mean, everybody loves you know the idea that Groot is now small and he's adorable. And Rocket now is almost talking to him about the detonation button. Like Rocket's like a father, and he's like, "Okay, come on, don't touch that button." And he's like, "I am Groot," and pointing at the button, and he's you know Rocket's flipping his you know his lid, and it's great. I mean, it's just the dynamic, especially my favorite shot in the trailer is the fact that Rocket has Groot on his back as he's spraying bullets, which is an homage to the first film where Groot had Rocket on his shoulder and Rocket was you know shooting, uh, shooting up his gun. This film looks fantastic. It looks like a fun, adventurous space odyssey, which is something that Guardians did really well I mean, it surprised everyone doing as well as it did at the box office. People rated it as one of the best Marvel films uh, that have been that have come out since the MCU has debuted with the first Iron Man, and that's a huge, huge thing to, to think about because these are characters that nobody really knew a lot about. Sure, you can think that people are going to get excited about Spider Man and you know uh, Iron Man and Captain America. You know, those are you know the stalwart characters of the Marvel universe, but to have this ragtag group come out and basically steal the MCU is unbelievable. And I think this movie is going to prove that the Guardians of the Galaxy was not a one-hit wonder. It's going to be just as fun, just as exciting. It's going to lead a lot into the setup of the Infinity War, which is going to be, I mean, 
God, I, I am so looking forward to seeing what Marvel and the MCU is going to do with the Infinity War. I read the Infinity Gauntlet. I read the Infinity War comics. I'm a huge fan, and I'm so glad to see a new twist on that story. I love Thanos as a villain. I love the idea that there's so much stuff that could go on in you know inside this you know world. So I'm really excited to see what we're gonna you know what's gonna wind up coming out of this. You know what's gonna what's just wind up coming out of it, of this at all. Um, the next thing I kind of want to talk about is we'll stick to the MCU. I waited until I saw Rogue One to see the Spider-Man trailer. I avoided the Spider-Man trailer on the internet. I mean, like it was the plague. I did not want to touch it. I wanted to see it in the theater. I wanted to get my own view on that movie. I wanted to figure out what that trailer was all about, and I wanted to see it on the big screen in front of my face. And let me tell you, I was not disappointed. The thing I couldn't get away from were a couple of still shots. The still shots didn't kill it for me. That I saw online, because I mean, let's face it, you go on Facebook, all you're going to see is memes, and Spider-Man, that film is becoming one of the biggest uh, films out there, so I mean, this is a huge, huge, huge uh, deal for Marvel to get these rights back, and to do it the way that they want to do it, um, I mean, what can you say about that trailer, the, uh, the scene where these guys are robbing banks in Iron Man and Thor masks, and you know... Spider-Man going, oh, you're not the real Avengers. I mean, oh my God, Tom Holland is the perfect Spider-Man. He's the perfect Peter Parker. I mean, they casted this so well. And I'm so excited to see what they're going to do with this film. Uh, I'm from Staten Island, seeing the ferry ripped in half and Spider-Man with the web gliders coming over, wrapping up the ferry in his, you know, in his spider webs, pulling it back together, saving people. I mean, this is just the coolest movie. This trailer blew me away far beyond the expectations I had for what Marvel was going to do with Spider-Man. Uh, I mean, Michael Keaton as Vulture is just, I mean, it's the perfect casting. Um, you know, they really did, I mean, they did such an excellent job. Uh, this trailer by and far blew me away. I was absolutely unbelievably impressed with what Marvel was able to do and to bring Spider-Man back to the forefront. Um, we're going to move on from that because, I mean, I could talk about this trailer forever. Um, there's still not a lot that we know about it. You know, there's a lot of people who are, who are casted that we don't exactly know what uh, characters are going to play. We didn't see a J. Jonah Jameson in the trailer. We didn't see um, exactly what the roles of Zendaya is. We didn't really see what, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the kids that were casted in, you know, in school as students, uh, we know Donald Glover, who's a huge, huge fan of uh, Spider-Man, was casted in the film. We don't even know what his role is. There's so much unanswered questions out of that trailer, but the trailer looks so good. We're going to move on now to the Wonder Woman trailer. And let me tell you something. I've, I've seen the Wonder Woman trailer. I know it's been out for a while, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. If you want a female lead driven superhero film Wonder Woman is the way to start and man Gal Gadot looks unbelievable as Wonder Woman I you know there's been a lot of stuff that's been going around ever since you know BVS that oh Wonder Woman doesn't she isn't she's supposed to be an Amazon warrior she doesn't you know she doesn't look like it she's not big enough if you watch that trailer and complained about what Gal Gadot looked like as Wonder Woman you're a moron she looked fantastic. She looks like a warrior. She looks like somebody who belongs. She looks like she can mix it up with anybody, men, women, beast, anything you can think of. Wonder Woman looks badass. I can't wait for this uh, for this movie. This trailer, you know, the action in it, uh, the theme song is you know so awkward but so catchy. I mean, everything that DC has done with Wonder Woman has been phenomenal. I know there's been a lot of stuff that's been said about uh, the DCEU. Um, and a lot of stuff can be said about it. I mean, you know, BVS and uh, Suicide Squad did well at the th you know in theaters, but they weren't exactly what DC was looking for as it pertained to quality, I, I would assume. I mean, they were really happy with how great Suicide Squad did it in, in the theaters, but a lot of people complained about, you know, the movie. I personally loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I think it was a great introduction to all those characters, and I think they did a good job. Yeah, maybe it skimmed a little bit on story, but, I mean, do you really need that much story? There are a group of, you know, villains that have to get together to help the government. I mean, that's all you need. There's not much else you need in a story. Um, 
But Wonder Woman looks like it's a complete package. It looks like you have the full story, her background, everything that, you know, where she started, why she's doing it, why she's, you know, going to come, you know, why she was in BVS. It's going to lead up to everything. And I think that Wonder Woman has the potential to show everyone that there, there is a market for a female-led superhero movie. There needs to be more females uh, that have action movies driven by them as the lead character. Um I think that it's one of those things where a lot of people don't think that, uh, you know, women can carry a film like that. But I think this is going to prove it, that there's absolutely no way in hell you can say that, you know, Wonder Woman is not going to do amazing at the box office. It's not going to be a great film. The final trailer I'm going to go over is by and far the one that, oh my God, it affected me the most. We have our problems with the X-Men franchise. Fox has done a great job in making great mutant movies, but they didn't really, haven't really done a great job of making good X-Men movies. Um, I personally really liked all the, the, the newer version, the newer films, uh, first class I, and, uh, days of futures past. And even, I know a lot of people had a lot of complaints about apocalypse, but I really liked all three of those films, but man, let me tell you, Wolverine, that franchise of films hasn't really been that well uh, well reviewed. Uh, a lot of people, you know, really didn't like either of the first two films, the first one especially. But man, that Logan trailer oh, it just hits you right in the gut. I get goosebumps every time I hear "Hurt" by Johnny Cash. Just every time I hear that song, I I get goosebumps. It's unbelievable, and they use that, and it's so powerful. And to see, you know, Wolverine, who looks like he's broken down, beaten up, his healing factor isn't working. The claws look like they hurt, like, even worse when they come out now. All, you know, making, you know, saying stuff like all the mutants, they're gone. Professor Xavier looking like he's near death. You know, it looks like we're going to see the death of Professor Xavier in this film. Uh, X-23, her debut, she's young, like, really, really young. And, you know, this is Wolverine's last stand, almost. Um, it looks like, you know, these two old men who are just, like, on their way to have, like, their, their final battle. Um, I don't want to see Hugh Jackman ever not be Wolverine. I know he's second-guessing, retiring the Wolverine character. Because I think he's perfect for the role. But, my God. This trailer blew me away. Fox, you can see with it, you know... A lot of negative things about, you know, the Fox franchises. You can talk about X-Men. You can talk about the abysmal Fantastic Four films that they, you know, that they attempted. Uh, I mean, and of course, you know, Deadpool's been, Deadpool was great. That's the exception. But, man, they are doing it right with Logan. I mean, if this film is an eighth of, you know, um, uh, of the emotion that, you know, throughout the entire film that there was in this, tra- in the, in this trailer, I mean, th- they, they did it right. More than anything else, I am looking forward to seeing Logan. Um, I, I got to say, this is going to be one of those films, and I'm going to get into a little bit of this uh, a little bit later when we talk about Rogue One. This may be one of those films that literally make me cry. Uh, I'm not a crier. Uh, I, I, I don't cry at all. Um, my wife refers to me as a robot. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't get emotional. Um but you can't help but not with this trailer. Just the content, the uh, the uncertainty of the characters. You know, seeing Professor X almost, you know, basically near death. Wolverine looking like, you know, there's he's got nothing left to give. But yet he's going to muster it up for this one last adventure. Man, Logan looks unbelievable. Well, now I think we're going to start to get into the main event of this podcast Star Wars Rogue One uh, came out a few weeks ago in theaters. I, like I said, I have, I've had the chance to see it twice. And uh, I'm going to give you my review of Rogue One. Uh, I will tell you this is full of spoilers, so if you haven't seen the film, you might want to go. Do yourself a favor. If you haven't seen Rogue One right now, hit pause on this video. Get up. Go to the movies. Go see Rogue One. Come back down, sit back down to where you are, where you were, and hit play, and you can listen to my review. This movie is absolutely unbelievable. I have never 
I never thought in a million years that Rogue One was going to be the, the movie that it was. I knew it was going to be good. I thought it was going to be a really solid film. I like the idea that we're getting the, you know, we're, we're seeing how the Death Star plans were obtained and put into Princess Leia's uh, hands to start uh, A New Hope. This is, but I mean, just everything that led up to this film, I mean, it's just, oh my God, it's absolutely unbelievable. Now, spoilers from here on out. Um, like I said, if you haven't gone to see it, go see it now. You're back? Good. All right. So here we go. We're going to start off with my, I mean, personally, I give this movie five stars. This may have been better than The Force Awakens, which, I mean, I know that this is our first you know, podcast together. This is the first Geek Guy podcast. But I, my, my opinion on The Force Awakens was that it was far more superior than I would have believed that it could have been. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know, weren't too crazy about the idea that it kind of rehashed some of the, you know, ideas from other Star Wars films. But it was a good jumping off point for this new trilogy. Now, here's Rogue One outside of this new trilogy. And, I mean, it blew me away. Absolutely blew me away. Um, I give this, like I said, it's a five-star film. It was emotional. It gave, you know, everybody had a purpose. Um, And... Literally, I think this is the film that should have been called The Suicide Squad because at the end of the movie, you can see the destruction that it's caused. And it's unbelievable. Um, you know, we're going to start off by talking to talking about uh, the characters. Um, I mean, you know, we have Galen Erso, uh, you know, in the beginning of the film, his wife gets shot and killed. Uh and then we have Jyn Erso, who is captured by, you know, Krennic and his cronies. And it's a great way to start everything off. Then we see Saw Gerrera uh, rescue Jyn Erso, and that's how we begin. Uh, the, the, the opening is moving. It's touching. Uh, I like that there was no opening crawl. I think that was that was a good choice. I mean, I know a lot of people were a little a bit upset about that, but this isn't a part of the Star Wars trilogies. So this is an outside film. I don't think there should have been a crawl for this. This is kind of like a side mission if you're playing a main game. There's no special intro for the side missions. Um, I, I had to say, Jyn Erso, Felicity Jones. I mean, she just did an unbelievable job at you know portraying this character um the scene where she sees galen is still alive and that he sent a message out to her and to saw Guerrera, and the, you know it's a hologram message and she's sitting there with these just tears in her eyes man and you can't help but get emotional in that her father who she hasn't seen for what looks to be i mean you know she had to been what maybe four or five when that whole happened you know maybe she's in her 20s so maybe you're thinking 16 years has passed since she's actually seen her father has no clue what he looks like doesn't even know if he's around this is one of those you know this film is just absolutely encapsulates the, the you know this character so well and Felicity Jones just does an amazing job as Jyn Erso um I love Cassian Endor uh Diego Luna I mean blew me away as Cassian he's I mean, it's called Rogue One, and he is the rogue in this film. He's like a scoundrel. You know, he goes out and he shoots his own, you know, the guy who's giving him inf- information because he's wounded and he's going to get him caught. He doesn't care. The Rebel Alliance is the only thing he cares about. He is a rebel first and everything else second. And he shows it throughout the entire film. He doesn't care who he screws over. He doesn't care what the mission is. He's going to go out and execute so that the rebels can get rid of the Empire. Um... K2SO is possibly the best droid in the Star Wars film history. I know I love R2-D2. I'm a huge fan of C-3PO. Um, if you want to talk even about Star Wars Rebels, Chopper is a great is a great character. But my God, K2SO is just the encapsulation of every droid that you ever could want into one. Uh, he is the comic relief in the film. And it's so amazing how they, you know, they, they've made a droid who's supposed to be this emotionless life form, the comic relief, by just having him be himself, basically. He's just a droid, but he's absolutely hysterical. Uh, I mean, the scene where he grabs the grenade and throws it behind him, blows up a whole bunch of stormtroopers, walks out, and is like, oh, yeah, I should just stay, I should just stay in, you know, in the sh- on the ship. 
I mean, it's just perfect. He's so good. And the most emotional part, one of the most emotional parts of the movie was seeing him holding off like 15 stormtroopers so that they can get these rebel, you know, the plans of the Death Star to the Rebel Alliance. It's absolutely unbelievable how they took this character, this robotic character, and made you so emotionally invested in him that when he dies... Both times I went to go see the film, there was an emotional gasp made from the crowd. Nobody else. I mean, Jin and uh, Cassian, when they die, are hugging on the beach as the uh, Death Star ray just like takes over the entire planet and kills them. And everybody was just like, oh, man, that kind of sucks. But the second K2SO died, everybody was like, oh, no. Oh, God. You know, it's amazing how much of an emotional connection that, they, that, that you know, they gave us when it came to the J- K2SO character. Um, Krennic and Tarkin are, you know, one of those, they, they've just, you know, that's where I think the, the, this movie may have had, like, the one knock against it. Krennic and Tarkin are good characters. They're great, to, they're good villains, but they're, they're not great villains, um, the villains in the film are more of just the Empire in general, but, you know, the embodiment of them in Krennic and in uh, Tarkin, I, I wasn't, you know, I don't think they did, you know, that fantastic of a job building them up and giving them, you know, their own personalized reasons to doing what they wanted to do. Krennic was a lot more interesting. I like the fact that he went to, to uh, Vader, that he wanted to, you know, Take credit for the entire for the Death Star for all the work he did. Tarkin is trying to take over all that credit. You know, I, I like that there was an internal struggle within there. I like how Vader was the one to kind of put you know the kibosh on that. Um, but I, I mean, I think it kind of lacked when it came to villains. Uh, I mean, I mentioned him now. Uh, I guess you know what? No, no, we'll get into Vader a little bit later because I mean that that's just a whole nother bag there. It's a whole nother uh, thing that you know I can talk about. Um, Real quick, we'll talk about, you know, the Bail Organa, the Mon Mothma, the Rebel Fleet uh, cameos. Um, the cameos from the uh, the two guys that bumped into uh, Luke and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi in A New Hope. There's a lot of really cool Star Wars cameos within this film. Uh, I liked how Bail Organa was in the film. I liked how that's how they mentioned Obi-Wan Kenobi. I love Mon Mothma. I think that she did, you know, they did a fantastic job with her. Uh, I loved how they, you know, you know, they went back and you know pulled some of that, you know, that footage out for the uh, old uh, Rebel Fleet. I think they did a great job when it came to the cameos. Um, what can we say about Baz Malbus and Charity anyway? I mean, I am one with the Force. The Force is with me. I am one with the Force. The Force is with me. Is going to be everybody's mantra for the next year. Um, Chirrut was one of the best characters I've ever seen. He's a blind guy. He's got a staff. He's kicking the crap out of stormtroopers. You know, he's like an inspirational uh, character in the film. Uh, His death was another one that was led, you know, a lot of people to uh, be really emotionally uh, upset uh, upset with. Um, One of the major things I've heard from people who reviewed this is that they don't, they felt like the characters weren't delved into enough and you didn't have an emotion, enough of an emotional connection to care that they all died. If you went to that film and didn't have an emotional connection with every single one of those characters, you're out of your mind. They did such a great job in building these characters up enough so that you can see that they had stakes, that you can see that you know where they came from, and you were you felt it when they all passed. I mean, every character in this film dies. Every one of our main characters dies. I mean, this is one of the first films you'll ever see where every main character is dead. It, it, it you know if we didn't know. About the new about a new hope before this, there's absolutely no way people would have walked out of the theater and said, "Oh my God, this is a great movie." Everybody would have been flipping out. They're like, "How can? Where the hell do we go from here?" Okay, Leia's got the Death Star plans, but everybody's dead. Half of the rebels are dead. Um, Bodhi was a great. That character was great. You know, we got. You know, he really you know wound up you know being like this you know this turncoat helping the uh, the rebellion. Sealing, you know, up, you know, making sure that you know he got that uh, that message out so they can get down the shield. I mean, Bodhi, Bodhi's death was hard to watch too. I, I mean, all these characters were amazing. I mean, maybe you can say that maybe Saw Gerrera, his death was a little bit, you know, underwhelming. Um, but you get where he was coming from. He's fought. 
he knows that now these plans are from Jen, are from Galen Erso are in Jin's hands, and we understand that you know there's that point where his job is done, and he doesn't want to run anymore. He's more machine than man at that point, almost like the uh, the idea of what they say about uh, Vader in, uh, in in Return of the Jedi. So this is a great, you know, I, I think I understand that, you know, Saw's death was maybe a little bit underwhelming, but that's kind of the character arc he needed. Um, I think that they did a good enough job with him, but uh, I guess there's only one thing to get, uh, else to get into. How badass was Darth Vader? I, when they had him, you know, they, they, you know the first, you know, uh, shot of him is in that bath, you know, recuperating whatever he has left. And it lowers just enough. You can see the top of his head, and you know it's Vader in there. I mean, it just it humanizes him a little bit. It gives you, if this would have been seen, this movie would have been made before A New Hope. This may have shown, given you a little bit more of a backstory on who Vader is, that he still is to a point human, but, you know, he, he's got to, you know, there's just so much of him that's gone that, you know, it, it humanizes him a lot more. Uh, it makes him seem like a little bit more vulnerable. However, that vulnerability goes out the window in about 10 seconds because he's on the bridge. He chokes Krennic without even putting his hand up. He force chokes Krennic without even lifting his hand. I mean, it's just so badass. I, they just did such a great job. And everybody wanted to see on screen Darth Vader in the costume just messing people up. And my God, did we ever get that this time. Here comes Vader with a lightsaber and just starts destroying all these guys on the Rebel fleet. Just starts cutting people down. They they do get the message, you know, the the, the uh, Death Star plans out, and Vader stands there like a badass, cape blowing in the wind, lightsaber in hand, thinking, "Well, I'm gonna have to go and I'm gonna find those uh, those plans now." And that's where a new hope starts. And my God, does Vader look like a badass? They did such a great job in two short scenes with making Darth Vader look more badass than he's ever looked in any other film that we've seen him in. He just destroys people. That this is the Darth Vader that people, the Darth Vader that people always wanted to see. There's a lot of st- a lot of people that are you know are hoping that we we do get a little bit more. Um, we get it like a Darth Vader standalone film where he just kind of hunts down all the remaining Jedi and starts to destroy them. I would love to see that. I want to see Vader as a badass, just with all his, you know, you know, with all the dark side abilities, and just start destroying people, hunting people down, destroying everybody in his path, making Vader look like a total badass. But if this is the most badass we see Vader on screen, man, did they do a great job? Um, I guess uh, to it looks like I think I may have covered everything I you know, I wanted to, um, you know. This film, for me, um, was emotional. Uh, I made the comment that I'm not a crier. I made the comment that I'm not an emotional person. But I I literally, at the end of this film, seeing the superimposed face of Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia, uh, getting the Death Star plans, tears welled up in my eyes. Um, And this was actually when I saw the film before Carrie Fisher had unfortunately passed away. And we lost our hope, and we lost our princess. Um, but it's absolutely just encapsulated this entire series. Um, it just invoked this emotional reaction to me, knowing that this was, this, you know, right before the start of something amazing, and that was the original Star Wars trilogy. Um, I mean, we can sit here and we can talk about what Carrie Fisher meant to the Star Wars franchise. How much she's going to be missed in episode in episode nine, but this film just evoked such an emotional response. The death of so many great characters, you know the the relationships that these characters developed, the bonds that they formed. I mean, Rogue One may be one of the top five best Star Wars films ever made, and to say that we can talk about a Star Wars film that didn't feature one Jedi in the film. I mean, you know, uh, of course the argument can be made Vader was once a Jedi, but I'm talking about one legitimate Jedi 
and this is the best film that we've seen in this franchise is an unbelievable accomplishment that the that Disney and uh, the Star Wars franchise has made. Personally, I think that this is one of the best movies that I've seen in the past couple of years. Um, anybody who pans this, any critics who pan who pan this, are either so far up their own butt when it comes to like the Star Wars franchise and the original the original franchise. The you know the original trilogy, and nothing else will ever be better than that. You got to take a step back. If you are a reviewer, you have to look at this film as a standalone film, and you got to understand. And you have to see that this movie was fantastic. It had everything you could want in it. The action was fantastic. Uh, this was one of the best films that I've seen in a while, and I stick to it in saying this may be top three in the Star Wars franchise as far as the Star Wars films. Uh, let me know what you guys think about Rogue One in the comments. Let me know what you guys think about the trailers in the comments. Um, to close out today, I'm going to give you guys a recommendation of a comic book to read. Um, uh, this is an old one. It's probably something that, you know, if you're listening to, you've probably you've probably read already. But um, I had a lapse in between being a comic book collector. Um, I had a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, when I was younger. You know, when things weren't cool, I stopped doing them because, you know... I was, you know, made fun of a lot and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I kind of like, you know, threw my geek side to the side, you know, to the side at points. And um, I kind of got back into uh, comics a couple of years ago. Um, one story that I had always wanted to read was House of M. Uh, I read that comic a couple of months ago, and it's absolutely fantastic. I've read the entire House of M series. If you guys are a big Marvel fan, go out and read House of M if you haven't already. If you have, let me know what you think uh, about it in the comments. And uh, maybe we'll start a little bit of a discussion next week if they get enough comments on there to read off some of the comments that you guys have made. And uh, we'll, you know, it, we'll, get a, we'll get a discussion going. Um, well, that's it for, uh, for us here today at the Geek Guy Podcast. Um, Thank you guys for listening, and I'll see you soon with another episode of the Geek Guy Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Geek Guy Podcast right here on the Slam Sessions Podcast Network. You can follow us on Twitter at the Slam Sessions. We'll see you guys next time, and may the force be with you.